It's a new week with loads of expectations ahead of this second week in the month of February, of course, in the year 2022. You're welcome to Business Morning here on Channel Television. I'm Ini John Mekwa. And uh, let's uh, start off with uh, oil prices. It's bouncing around this morning. <laughs> Analysts call it in a seesaw trading with some investors taking profits after signs of progress in the U.S.-Iran nuclear talks, while other kept, uh, others kept bullish sentiments bold Stirred by rising consumption and amid ongoing supply constraint. Brent's crude was up 20 cents to $93.47 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas intermediate crude fell 33 cents to $91.98 a barrel. U U.S. President Joe Biden's administration has restored sanctions waivers to Iran to allow international nuclear cooperation projects as a talks on the 2015 international nuclear deal enters the final stretch. And uh, if the United States lifts sanctions on Iran, the country could boost oil shipments, and this would add to global supply. Fueling supply concerns, tensions remain high in Eastern Europe, with White House National Secretary Advisor Jake Sullivan saying that Russia could invade Ukraine within days or weeks, but could still opt for a diplomatic path. Well, OPEC Plus on its part is still struggling to meet targets despite pressure from top consumers to raise production even more quickly. We come to Nigeria now as a signatory to the 20, 2001 Abuja Declaration. 15% of Nigeria's annual budget should cater for the needs of the health sector. However, this target has again been missed in the 2022 budget, which allocates about 876.38 billion naira of over 17 trillion naira. That's just about 5% to the health sector for this year. However, from the perspective of the Minister of State for Health, Senator Lorne Bebamora, the gap can still be bridged with proper implementation of schemes such as the Universal Health Insurance Scheme. Well, I did a, this report putting together expectations from the 2022 budget and what you could see at the end of this year. Let's see the reports. According to the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, infant mortality currently stands at 69 per 1,000 live births, while for under fives, it rises to 128 per 1,000 live births. More than half of the under five deaths, that's 64%, results from malaria, pneumonia, or diarrhea. Currently, Nigeria contributes 10% of global deaths for pregnant mothers, placing its maternal mortality rate at 576 per 100,000 live births, the fifth highest on earth. This sounds the need for urgent attention to the health sector, emphasized by the consequences of COVID-19 pandemic. To cater for this, the 2022 budgets allocate 876.38 billion naira as a total for health allocation. The Ministry of Health and Agencies gets 770.87 billion naira, immunization 49.37 billion naira, basic health care provision fund gets 56.14 billion naira, and hazard allowance for health workers has 50 billion naira. When Mr. President was going to sign that budget, yeah, he signed the budget with a lot of reservations uh, based on observations in terms of uh, alleged padding. The, there is a process on now to submit these uh, amendments, which Mr. President hinted would be made and uh, be sent to the National Assembly before you can then have the, the, the final figures. So. Um, but having said that, the first thing to say uh, on a general basis is that we, we of course, you, we have mandates as uh, given by Mr. President. These include issues uh, having to do with uh, uh, mandatory and universal health uh, insurance uh, schemes, and of course, with the collaboration between the national and the sub national uh, the, uh, the government. And all. It's no wonder that the Universal Health Insurance Scheme is prioritized for 2022, as it has the potential to make up for funding 
However, while the National Health Insurance Scheme became operational in 2005, records show that almost 77% of Nigerian population still practice out-of-pocket payment. The solution may lie in decentralizing the scheme. Insurance is a game of number. When you have the number, the chances are that you are going to have reduced premium. All of us will begin to also think of, okay, look, we want to go in universal health coverage. Can we encourage all Nigerians to have at least the basic health care plan, on top of which people can top up if they have ability to pay for it? So far, 19 states, which include Anambra, Delta, and Lagos, have adopted universal health coverage through establishments of their respective health insurance schemes. However, personal and brain drain, which surged in the midst of COVID-19, stands in the way of optimal implementation. There are a lot of setbacks by the emergence of this COVID-19. Because we have a challenge of human resource, looking into the number of health facilities we have, 819. And of course, looking into the number of health personnel we have, to manage these 819 health facilities is not easy. The Minister of State for Health hints that with the myriad of needs in the sector, the federal government is working with the private sector on various fronts. One of sorts, you, you, you recall that not long ago, um, the uh, Africa Exim Bank, um, they, 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 they had the turning of the sword here in Abuja. Don't forget that we have BVNL right now, the vaccine and Joy Limited, which is a joint venture, uh, a kind of a special purpose vehicle that, we, we, that has been put in place. It's a joint venture between the federal uh, and uh, the private uh, uh, you know, pharmaceutical company. The collaboration with the private sector to boost funding may already be yielding fruit, as seen in the recently launched 62.1 billion naira HIV trust fund of Nigeria, which is to cater for not just HIV, but other deadly diseases. In John Mekwa, Channels Television News. Well, moving away from the health budget now, looking at sustainable finance, the Nigerian Sustainable Finance Roadmap, according to the Green Finance Platform, provides an analysis of sustainable finance opportunities in Nigeria out, of tw out to 2030 and assesses the characteristics of these opportunities and estimates current sustainable finance flows. This conversation comes on the heels of Nigeria being a signatory, of course, to the Paris Agreement, participation in the COP26, to, uh, 26, and we know that Egypt is gearing up for COP27 in November. Well, Nigeria's current climate goal set in July is to reduce emissions by 20% below a business as usual projection by 2030. Now let's find out how Nigeria or the path on Nigeria is taking to this uh, forecast and projection and of course this plan. We'll have this conversation with Adeze Uzo Kalu. She's an investment banker and industry expert and she joins us from Abuja studio. Good morning Adeze, good to see you. Good morning Nini, how are you doing? Good morning. Great, good morning. Good to so, see you too. Yeah, so the world is talking about climate change and embracing clean energy. Should Nigeria, I mean, when we want to be realistic, uh, looking at, uh, of course, the fact that Nigeria's mainstay is coming from crude oil, you know, should Nigeria be part of this conversation at this time? Well, I, mean, I think Nigeria should be part of that conversation at this time. Um, like you rightly said, Nigeria did sign the Paris Agreement in 2015. Not only that, we have quite a lot of issues uh, when it comes to environmental challenges. We have floods everywhere, desertification in the, in, the, um, in the north. We have pollution, erosion. And so Nigeria should be part of that climate um, change conversation. And, and the Climate Change Vulnerability Index actually states that Nigeria is one of 10 countries that are vulnerable to, to climate, um, climate change. So yes, we should be part of that conversation. <laughs> okay, so where is the implementation of the Nigerian Sustainable Finance Roadmap? Where are we now? Okay, uh, so the Nigeria Sustainable Finance Roadmap uh, developed by the United Nations Environment Program um, is very much, um, you know, where it should be in terms of implementation. Um, capital market stakeholders um, are doing so well and even regulators are doing so well in terms of 
um, um, ensuring that there is a level of awareness um, in terms of uh, sustainable uh, finance and climate action. Um, we're doing a lot in terms of mobilizing funds towards green projects. Um, the regulators have um, rolled out um, policies. Uh, recently, the Securities and Exchange Commission rolled out the sustainable um, finance principles for the Nigerian capital market. We also have the green bond uh, rules by the SEC as well. Uh, exchanges are doing so uh, well in terms of capacity building, workshops, stakeholder engagements and awareness, training. Um, so much is going on. Um, not only that, the proof of that is that we've uh, totally, the total bonds we have right now in the capital market is about 55.52 billion. And that is both sovereign and corporate bond issuances. So we're doing well. Um, there's progress in terms of implementation. And that is, um, um, that is just where we should all be in terms of um, everyone um, putting their hands on deck to grow the pie. Yeah, so talking about funding now, in 2016, Nigeria raised 20 billion naira. That's about $63 million to help fund renewable energy projects. And that was the first issuance uh, of green bonds in the country. Now, what... Have we, are we seeing those projects uh, this, uh, from the funding so we don't just have the fund and celebrate that? Do we see the impact really as it should be? Um, I think uh, we're in the step, taking steps in the right direction. Um, since the issuance of that bond, we've also had uh, 10.69 billion on the sovereign side. Um, we've had corporate bonds come to market with 15 billion with Access Bank, NOTSA Power. Um, 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 that was raised, 8.5 billion was raised to finance the uh, Shiroro Hydroelectric Power. Access Bank raised money to. Um, to fund um, uh, sustainable um, solar power and sustainable energy and agriculture. So I think um, definitely there is um, evidence because the impact reports they've generated over time has also shown that there's they're taking steps in terms of developing um, um, green projects uh, for the Nigerian economy. So the impact reports are very important. They have great technical support from the capital market, from advisors, and so definitely um, we can see the projects, uh, definitely, and see the evidence. But it's, I mean, it's a drop in the ocean, but there's room for development as well, at the same time. Yeah, I guess to say that uh, the most important thing is that we've started the conversation. Well, there's also, the, of course, the Paris Agreement. There's COP2016, which Nigeria participated in last year and uh, most likely will again in Egypt this year. Do you see intentional efforts to follow through with promises? Our president was there last year for COP26, and we had some promises and some targets. Do you see intentional steps and, you know, strategies to achieve some of the promises made? I would say yes, Ini. Um, there are this particular administration, they've done so well in terms of climate action. Um, we have policies that have been um, um, rolled out, um, such as the Climate Change Act, in November 21, and um, we've also have, we also have the Interministerial Committee on Climate Change, and these are all championed by the Ministry of Finance. The presidency very much, um, and his delegates were very much present at the COP26, and I think for me the COP26 was very much more about implementation and the reality of the challenges the developing countries have in terms of um, access access to long-term capital. But I'll say that definitely um, 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 the government and Nigeria as a country are, are committed to, uh, to, to um, all the agreements, the pledges from the uh, Glasgow, Glasgow uh, Climate Act and also um, the Paris Agreement. I think they're committed and I think there's action and um, a lot of development has happened um, thus far. Well, you know, some people have the impression that uh, perhaps the Western world is trying to push this thing down their throat before our time. I remember late last year, uh, in the height of uh, the hike in energy prices, countries like China, uh, UK, they went back you know, to coal, which is what shouldn't be. You know, so really, you know, when we want to see what we are doing and what we should be doing, should we or what should we be doing now without cutting out or you know hitting ourselves or cutting off our own source of income you know because we want to follow what the world is saying or what the western world is saying oh any this is a controversial topic um <laughs> but i'll say that um development is is a gradual process 
And you are right in terms of uh, a country like Nigeria, which is uh, which has assented or approved the uh, Petroleum Industry Act. We are uh, a fossil fuel um, economy. We are reliant on it, but we are also at the same time. Um, transitioning and changing towards a more sustainable economy to more, towards more development, which is very critical. Um, yes, other worlds or the other Western countries will feel that, um, you know, the European uh, countries use coal to develop their own countries and then now they're saying, okay, you can't. And even Russia's um, 2035 strategy does show an increase in coal production for the Asian market. And so what I'll say to you is that um, it's a gradual process. They've, um, they are looking, uh, um, the, the countries are looking to ensure commitment to the Paris Agreement. And this is critical for the conference of the parties and the presidency and, um, and all, all, all countries. It's very critical that countries stick to the Paris Agreement and to the now the new Glasgow Climate Act in terms of transitioning from fossil fuel and the reduction of coal and greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, so let's go to the private sector now. How much of uh, uh, buy-in do we have from, the, from corporate Nigeria? How are businesses aligning to these overall goals of climate change and uh, clean energy? So I think that a lot of corporates and businesses um, are doing well because a lot of awareness has been created about sustainable finance, the sustainable development goals, about, um, about climate change. So corporates in Nigeria um, are saddled with the responsibility of ensuring that their activities now have to align towards sustainable development goals. Now, you know businesses are connected to the government, connected to the people, connected to communities. So they have that responsibility to start ensuring that they align. But I think that a lot of corporates have aligned um, or they're even revamping their overall business strategies to align with gender diversity or gender equality, to align with you know, environmental issues, social issues. And even quoted companies now uh, um, are actually man mandated to, um, to submit reports in terms of their sustainable growth, their corporate social responsibilities, um, um, and the women and diversity reports. You can see that the international companies are doing that, big companies are doing that. So I think corporate Nigeria are following suit and are, are, are doing their very best to grow the pie. Doing their very, very best, I think. But there is room for more stakeholder awareness, definitely room for more engagement in terms of creating that awareness as to the impact of their business activities. All right, and uh, there's the Green Climate Fund. How, uh, what's that about and who should benefit from it? So the Green Climate Fund is uh, um, governed by the 194 countries um, and is obviously the headquarters in South Korea. We have a board, the Green Climate Fund has a board, and every country, and it's really to support developing countries that are trying to um, uh, adapt to climate, uh, climate action. Now, um, in Nigeria, the Department of Climate Change under the Ministry of Environment oversees the, uh, uh, the management of the Green Climate, climate Fund. Now, any company or organization or um, startup that has uh, a climate-related project, especially one that has to do with the mitigation of greenhouse gas emission, can apply for this fund. Um, but the process is a little bit tedious in the sense that you'll have to definitely put together a business plan, put together your financial plan, and then an accredited company will need to sort of review that and then the submission goes to the Ministry of um, Environment, Department of Climate Change. Now, that department has to issue a letter of no objection um, um, to, the, uh, to, the, the, to the potential um, the best potential company, and also uh, that gets submitted through the accredited agency to the board in South Korea. The board sit once a quarter and then they make decisions on the countries or projects they, they want to finance. So the project has to be bankable, and it definitely has to be about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, so solar power, renewable energy, and the likes. Yeah, well, sounds uh, really like a long process there, and I hope that Nigerian businesses can access it and put their books together to uh, make the most of it. Well, 
We really have to stop it there. Thank you so much, Adeze Ozokalo, investment bank and industry expert, for sharing your thoughts with us on sustainable finance in Nigeria this morning. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Ini. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Great. Great to have you. We'll take a break now. When we come back, uh, we'll talk about food security and also developing the value chain in agriculture to boost employment. That's our next conversation on Business Morning here on Channels Television. Welcome back. Well, over the past five years, the agriculture sector has contributed an average of 23.5% to the GDP and generated 5.1% of export earnings for a sector which employed 34.66% in 2020. And that's according to the International Labour Organization. Developing the value chain could mean creating more employment and higher contribution to the GDP. How should we do this? I mean, we've talked a lot about the sector, but I guess there's still more to talk about. We have the Chief Executive Officer of Ella Lakes PLC, uh, Chuka Modi, joining us to share his thoughts. Uh, hello, Chuka. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Thank good you. to have you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so uh, we, we've talked a lot about the agriculture sector mm -hmm. from uh, what we now call a glorious day you know, that seemed to be in the past before the discovery of crude oil yes. to what seems to be uh, a lot of struggles now in security, uh, logistics struggle. Uh, share with us, uh, what are we missing out in the sector? Why does it seem like we are not maximizing the, um, uh, the opportunities in the agricultural sector, especially when you talk about value chain development? Uh, I don't think it's one simple thing that we're <clears throat> missing out on. I, there, there are a variety of things. And I think when you start from the, the, the policy perspective and then the <clears throat> implementation of policy, uh, I think you know, government has a large part to play in this, but also the private sector has a large part to play, play in this. Uh, I think you know when you discuss things like access to credit for smallholders, uh, fixing infrastructure, roads, rail, transport infrastructure that helps logistics. So these are sort of bottlenecks uh, in the in the agricultural space that, along the value chain, if they were fixed, could lead to more efficiency. Mm. Well, when we talk about value chain, we'll be talking a lot about um, the issue of storage, yes. preservation. I mean, you just talked about uh, you know yes. getting the the crops. From the rural area where most of them are produced to the mm -hmm. to the have we made progress because we keep talking about it it's just have we made any progress uh i i, I suppose the 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 accurate answer is we've made some progress uh laudable progress minute progress meaningful progress <laughs> uh, so let's address a few things say transport from rural areas to urban areas so from the farm to essentially where most of the consumption is uh, if you don't fix roads then it's really impossible to optimize your logistics uh, uh, logistics and if the roads are a responsibility of, of the government now the government budget just simply doesn't have enough financing to fix all the roads necessary from the rural areas to the urban areas. So I think we have to look at a combination of, of ways in which to, to solve that particular problem. Uh, silos, storage, simply put, the government doesn't have enough financing to also do this. So it's a combination of uh, public sector and the private sector also uh, in trying to fix these problems. So we have uh, uh, initiatives like the Rice Pyramid yes. that was celebrated a couple of uh, things about two weeks now yeah. since that was celebrated. And one of the things that the CBN governor said there, mm. because we've, of course we had food inflation, leading mm. inflation mm. <laughs> for a long time now, mm. that initiatives such as that mm. uh, would make an impact and we should see a tapering or moderation of uh, food inflation. Mm. Do you share that perspective? Uh, well, my, my, I would say the rice pyramids are a result of certain policy initiatives uh, trying to get uh, credit into the, into the private sector and uh, focusing on particular crops to, to, to try and optimize production in, in those areas. Uh, what I would say is there are many ways of trying to do this. Uh, I mean, with LLX, uh, we're focused on what the Africa Development Bank is doing in terms of trying to develop staple crop processing zones. Uh, we're in Enugu State. We just recently got into Adarais in Enugu State, and we've also got 5,000 hectares in Ondo State. 
what we're trying to develop is is in 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 consonance with the African Development Bank, the AFDB. So we have staple crop processing zones where we're trying to compress or try and concentrate a, a large aspect of the value chain in one particular area. So we're doing maize, uh, we're doing soya, and we're doing cassava. And the plan is to go from production of primary to processing uh, all in the same space or in a particular area of space. So you have ancillary activities around that. And what you try to do is optimize your farm to fork value chain. Uh, and I think if this could be scaled up, that's one way of, of trying to increase efficiency uh, in the agricultural space or in the agribusiness space. How can that be scaled up? What's, what's remaining? Uh, I think scaled up from the point of view of investment by large agribusinesses. Uh, there are significant ones in Nigeria, Bua, uh, Dangote, Flour Mills, Okomu, Presco. So it's one, diversifying across a variety of food crops. So the Nigerian Agricultural Strategic Plan has a focus on six uh, major crops. Uh, the African Development Bank has a focus on about 18 uh, major food crops and cash crops. But I think you need a significant companies who have large balance sheets, access to credit and access to equity. And I think that's the most important thing, that they have access to significant amounts of equity to actually scale up. And we're talking billions of, do billions of dollars in, in terms of trying to grow these staple crop processing zones. But what you do is, they're mostly rural areas because that's where you get the space to actually build these, these, uh, these agri-parks. So you can call them agro-parks, processing zones. There are a variety of names for them. But if you can focus on these in rural areas, scale up and build the industrial uh, framework around them, then what you've got is primary production. You've got processing, so you're optimizing the value chain in one particular area. And if you have a variety of them, uh, what it does is it also takes ancillary jobs to rural areas. It takes non-farm jobs to rural areas. So it's almost like economics. You have a multiplier effect in these areas. So that grows the economy, not just the agribusiness space. And I think you know, that's one way. And I'm not saying that's the golden, the silver bullet to fixing the problem. But I think that's one way of taking a, a, a large part of the logistics problem out of, out of the equation. Isn't it possible? Because, I mean, I know you mentioned uh, just a handful of them now who, yes. whose balance sheet you think can accommodate this. Isn't it possible to get medium players, medium you know, capacity players yes. to come together. So, I mean, because everybody's going to call on Dangote. Dangote yes. is in the true, fertilizer. True, true, <laughs> and I, don't, I think you're right. We shouldn't, it shouldn't be to the, ex, to the exclusion of all others. I think we require all the players in the agribusiness space to work together. So the large players, the medium-sized players. And I think it's, it's not possible to achieve food security and uh, what we, where we want to get to without even the smallholders being part of the equation. So I think even, like I said, policy is important, but how you implement the policy is, is also very important. So getting inputs to smallholders, fertilizers, herbicides, credit to buy seedlings. Uh, and if we could do that efficiently, then we have increased yields from smallholders. If we have increased yields from smallholders, you know, there's more, for, more in terms of supply, uh, a reduction in food price inflation, which I think is very important. And I think that's a start to trying to optimize the, the, the agribusiness value chain. Mm. And, and then cocoa is, is the mainstay of Nigeria after oil. Uh, I mean, when you talk about the agriculture space. As, as a subset of the agribusiness yeah, space, yes. Yes. Yeah, but we still do the raw cocoa yes, exports. Yes, mostly, Are yes. there conversations around adding value to a crop like cocoa? I mean, I know mm. I spoke to someone on the program and mm. the person said, oh, in some countries, because of Valentine, yes. you know, more attention and intentional strategies being put yeah. to develop things like cocoa because of chocolates mm. and Valentine is just around the corner. Mm. Are we having such conversations in Nigeria? Do we even mm. see potentials like that? I think, yes, you can have these conversations. I mean, there, there's at least one extant cocoa processing facility uh, in Nigeria. I, I don't know how well it's doing because I, we're not focusing on, on that space. But I think there are two important things here. If you want to process, you have to understand the nature of the market uh, and the supply demand framework. Uh, what is the consumption of chocolates in Nigeria? What's the consumption of, what's the size of the, the market in terms of finished products? Uh, does it make sense to 
have a significant capital expenditure on trying to process when the market isn't here. So I have no idea about the nature of the finished products market, but I suspect the European market is probably bigger for chocolates. Uh, so can't we, can't we process for exports? I mean, we're talking about a reserve. A reserve is makes, down. That would make a lot of sense. <laughs> but of course, if you're It could be a strategy. If it's not in our culture true, for consumption, yeah, it could just be a strategy to process for exports. And that could be Agreed. another crude oil for us. Agreed. Very true. But to set up a cocoa processing plant, I mean, that's heavy industry. Most of the components would need to be imported, imported. into Nigeria. So you would need to have access to foreign exchange because you can't buy these products in Naira. Uh, if you had the equity to do that, then you have a buffer in terms of your investment. If you borrowed, if you borrowed the money, then you have debt to service, and then you have, you know, issues. Overhead costs. And Precisely. So it's a it's a complex set of uh, of computations in deciding whether or not to do certain things. Is the market there? Is there an import substitution play, or does it make more sense to actually? export the unfinished, the raw products. Uh, so processing, I think you have to take into, take into, uh, uh, you have to reflect on a variety of, of options before you decide on what to do. Uh, well, we have, we have a market for tomatoes, but I hear we still, we still import tomatoes, processed, but so paste, puree, tomato yes, paste. tomato puree. We, ha we, we still, we still import it. Because that's a I function of the type of tomatoes that you're growing, one. Uh, where you're growing them to, and also having the industrial capacity to actually process it into paste and into puree. Mm. So does that, uh, does it mean we cannot change our taste and accommodate what we have? China did it. Yes, <laughs> I know, I know some years back, yes. uh, it used to be, China used to be known, you know, for the inferior quality and all that. But now, I mean, even their cars, they're being yes. used. So. But I don't think, <laughs> two things, I don't think we should ever underestimate the 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 industrial capacity that China has always had. Uh, I think the, the base we're coming from is very, very, very different. And I, I think it's probably a slightly invidious comparison. Uh, Nigeria is coming from a separate place. Uh, the Chinese had latent industrial capacity. Uh, we have industrial capacity that is, that is we, we don't have the, the sort of industrial capacity to grow. So we, in many aspects, we have to start from scratch. So you need also So where power. should we start from? I mean, we can't just give up on this great country with all the potentials, potentials, mm -hmm. potentials yeah. we keep talking about. Where should we start from? Uh, what would I mean, be our low-hanging fruit, for instance? Yes. Well, I would say potential. Everyone has potential. Yes. It's, it's about actualizing it. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to the first point I made about policy. You've got to get the policies right first. Don't we and have policies? We, we do have a lot of great policies in Nigeria. Policies are like potential. Unless you actualize them, they're of very little value or, or no value at all. And I think the policy implementation is part of the issue. The, the Nigerian macro picture also has a large part to play in it. So you want low inflation, so you have lower interest rates, which can provide better access to credit. If we fix the rail lines from, say, Lagos to Kano, if you reduce significantly the cost of transport, that probably adds a few hundred basis points to you know, economic growth year on year. So there are a variety of, I think, interventions from the, from the, from the gov government perspective that, you know, if you're And from what you have player, said, it's, it seems um, the infrastructure development is, is at the very root of, of it. What are we losing in, in the aspect of uh, infrastructure or lack of infrastructure development? Uh, I don't want to hazard a guess as to what we're losing because it would be guesswork. But I think it's possible to compute what we're not gaining, which is significant growth. Uh, in the last 15 years, I don't think we've hit double-digit economic growth year on year at any point. And I think in order to actually have any kind of transformational steps, or it would be necessary to get the double-digit economic growth year on year in order to transform, transform the space and to transform the economy. And infrastructure development has a major role to play in that? I think infrastructure development has a key role to play in that. And also, I think, just as key as infrastructure development is, is education. Uh, education, I think, is possibly more important or just as important as developing the infrastructure. Because if you import heavy industry, you need people who can actually manage the heavy industry. So uh, education, I think, is a key aspect of, of the, the development and growth.
All right, uh, thank you so much, uh, Chuka Modi, for joining us for this conversation this morning. Chief Executive Officer of Ella Lakes PLC. Thank you very much. We do hope one day this conversation will change. I expect so. Yeah. <laughs> we'll not just be talking about the potential, but the fact, yeah. the fact that we have started and then mm -hmm. we move to the next stage mm -hmm. and the next stage. Thank you so much for coming on the thank show. Thank you very much. So now, uh, let's move from agriculture to the market. Uh, let's see what happened in the market. The FX market to start with uh, last week, well, in the FX sports and derivatives market, the total turnover for the week ended the 4th of February was $631.36 million, and that's represented more than 1% decrease from the $636.14 million reported for the week ended the 28th of January. The week-on-week -week decrease uh, now uh, in total turnover was driven by 8.33%, and that's $13.83 million. The decrease in FX derivative turnover despite the one point four nine percent uh, percent and then increase in FX sports turnover respectively but there was also a decrease in the FX derivatives turnover and so it's driven by 28 percent uh, decrease in FX features turnover and despite that's despite at the one percent increase in FX forwards uh, turnover we have uh, Eki now joining us to tell us uh, some some of her observations uh, from the market activities last week. Hello, Eki. Good morning. Eki is FX Dilat Access uh, uh, Bank. Hello, Eki. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me today. So uh, what was your overview of the activities in the FX market last week? Um, okay, what we saw last week at the FX market, um, the turnover actually closed at $631 million, um, while the NASDAQ trade closed at 416.07, which um, a dip from, which an increase from uh, 415.81 from the previous week. While on the INE side, there was also an appreciation to 416.33 from the previous week. The CBN conducted its um, usual, its usual, um, Retail SMI auction for both um, for importers of goods and um, raw materials. Um, we expect the results of that um, auction to come out this week. There was we also saw some um, FPI intervention from the CBN um, as well as um, payment of the delivery of the forward allocation that were also sold to the FPI. Um, so that's what really happened throughout the week. There was no there was no much difference from what what has been happening in the previous week. More happening in the week last on the FX market. Mm, but we see that uh, foreign reserve is now below the $40 billion. Um, obviously, the effect of the SDR and the euro bond, they are gone now. And uh, do we see this coming up this week? Um, yes, as you rightly mentioned, um, we saw there has actually been a steady um, um, decrease okay. on the reserves, um, but just what, what, what um, caught everyone, everyone's attention was the um, sub-40 mark, uh, which is about 39.82 as a Friday. Um, as Becky mentioned, the effect of the SDR and the IMF is um, inflows into the reserve as, as always and um, also did due to the, the frequent um, SPI intervention from the CBN, um, as well as we have not really seen any inflow from these SPIs back into the economy. So we think, um, I think CBN, I think CBN is also putting measures in place to attract foreign investors to bring back their, their funds back into the economy so we can get some increments in that part as well. All right, Eki, what from your perspective is, let's say, a desperate move that can be taken, you know, to boost, at least let's get back to the $40 billion. Do you see anything that can do that in the short term? Uh, in the short term, I think, um, in the short term, the inflows that we can get that could boost up that, um, uh, boost up that uh, reserve is just from the FPIs and other, probably other export cases into the, into the account. Um, probably, uh, probably just to maintain, to stabilize the rate, um, the, the exchange rate, as well as um, maybe increase um, the, um, borrowing, in the interest on borrowing and so from the FPIs as well. So there'll be an attraction to bring that funds into that. But I don't think there's any any desperate move that can happen right now. 
aims that we will make the um, foreign investors come back into the economy. But if um, CDN is trying to work on some things, it does, but that should be the easiest way out for now. Okay. All right. So uh, we'll keep looking up to the CBN and hope that uh, they get some great ideas that would uh, boost Hopefully. the reserve. Thank you so Thank much, you. Eki, for sharing your thoughts with us. Eki Teddy Onagese was a uh, FX dealer at Access Bank. Well, we'll take a break now. When we come back, we'll head straight to London, where Julia and I are standing by to stay with us. It's Business Morning on Channel Television. You're welcome back. Well, the UK national health scheme in England seems to be facing a tight time, and this is elongating the waiting list, especially in England. We have Juliana now joining us to tell us more. Hello, Juliana. Good morning. Good morning, Annie. So there's supposed to be a plan to handle the backlog, and it's supposed to be published today. What's the update on that? Yeah, well, we know that um, the NHS has... Uh, been um, inundated uh, with uh, patients that have been waiting for non-urgent um, surgeries. According to the latest data, I think there are about six million people on waiting lists, and they've been waiting purely due to COVID-19 and the overwhelming demand of patients visiting um, hospitals. Uh, now, the NHS, uh, led by um, Health Secretary Sajid Javid, was supposed to publish today uh, plans to reduce that waiting list in England, but um, it's been stopped, it's been halted. We don't know why. However, over the weekend, the Daily Telegraph have been reporting that perhaps there's a spat uh, between the Treasury and the NHS. We know uh, that the, um, the Chancellor Rishi Shunak did announce quite controversially uh, that uh, the national insurance um, payments would rise in April uh, to fund £12.5 billion uh, to put towards the NHS. Now, that has become increasingly controversial because we know that the cost of living um, has exasperated and we know that energy bills are rising really high in the UK. Is that one of the reasons why um, this plan to kind of mitigate these long lists has been stopped? We don't know. We've not heard anything um, from Whitehall uh, to rebuke uh, some of the claims that the Daily Telegraph have made. But as we know of today, uh, it was supposed to come out, this plan, and um, it's, it's been halted. All right, uh, Juliana. Well, uh, I guess that uh, is a story that we'll have to follow up on. Uh, but what are we expecting for the week? What's the outlook for the week? Yeah, pretty quiet corporate week, I say, on a Monday morning. Uh, this 24 hours is a long time in the business world. But I suppose um, in terms of economics, Friday is the big day, GDP day uh, for the month of December. During the month of November, we saw an increase of GDP by 0.9%, much higher than the 0.4% anticipated. And for the first time ever, the British economy was back um, to its pre-pandemic size, 0.7% higher than it was uh, January uh, 2020. We are expecting uh, perhaps a 0.2% rise in December, not that much, because we know at this time the Prime Minister had asked 5 million people to work from home. Shops and some uh, restaurants were closing because of the Omicron wave. So some of the gains that were made in November will be lost in December, but we are still expecting a gain, but we'll just have to wait and see until Friday, Annie. Yeah, we'll still have a lot of things to talk about this Friday. I know, I know. That's a come on. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you again at 1.30, Juliana. Thank you. So let's uh, move to the crypto space now with Ladi. Ladi, I know it was a green weekend. Uh, I don't know what the Monday looks like. It's yeah. a blue one, I guess. Yes, it's actually a green uh, <laughs> Monday. I was expecting some kind of pullback, but uh, surprisingly, the market just uh, from nowhere. See, Bitcoin just edged up over the weekend, and it's looking quite good uh, right now. Looking at the sentiment in the market right now is at uh, 45 points. That's almost neutral. Quite good. We've been in extreme greed for uh, most of last, uh, extreme uh, fear, most of last month, but now getting to about the neutral zone, which is a sign that traders are getting back into the game. Uh, market cap, it's uh, down by 1.71% uh, this morning. Uh, volume traded, $73.50 billion, up 8.64%. And we see Bitcoin dominance sitting at 41.83% uh, this morning. Uh, price of Bitcoin sitting pretty above the 40,000 level, it broke that resistance, and now it's at $42,713, up 3%. Uh, 
Most traders are seeing the road there back to the 50K uh, region. Brains to be seen. Volume traded this morning, uh, $21.15 billion uh, traded in Bitcoin. Price of Ethereum above the $3,000 mark, also up 2.82%. Uh, volume traded in Ethereum, $11.81 billion. We've seen Ethereum able to uh, break that $3,000 resistance. Some are saying, oh, well, maybe the Chinese have woken back up and are back in the market. We see uh, the rise going on right now. Uh, top bottom market cap, you see it's uh, uh, mostly green there with XRP, the biggest jumper this morning, 12.06%. It's at 74 cents, trying to get back above that 80 cent uh, region. And we see BNB there up 3.31%. Uh, Solana, $118, up 4.96%. It's quite a, a green market we're seeing right there. Uh, let's bring in Olumde additional now, financial market analyst. Hello, Olumde. Yeah, hello, lad. It is a green Monday. Yeah, Green Monday, quite interesting. I, I, I believe the Chinese have woken up? Yeah, friendly relative, but I, I think it's much more than that because um, if you look at um, the Friday shoot up um, after the impressive job report, one would have expected uh, that Bitcoin to fall below $35,000. But contrary to uh, market reaction, um, Bitcoin um, rebounded strongly. And um, from technical analysis, it shows that. Uh, one of the reasons why Bitcoin um, surged to that record was because of it was in an oversold position. So a lot of undervalued institutional investors uh, keyed into the market. And we saw Bitcoin rally over the weekend. And now it's presently trading at over $42,000. But the narrative is really that uh, though Bitcoin has the momentum, um, we should not uh, we should not uh, throw caution out of the wind because uh, there are still structural issues that come into play. We're expecting the staple coin regulation in a matter of few weeks. Some countries are already um, enforcing and their stance on crypto. You look at take an instance of India. India is taxing about 30% on crypto transactions. That's very very expensive. And the Russians also, despite the fact they've retreated from banning crypto assets, they've not brought in a um, well-structured framework around crypto regulation. So the market is still uh, looking at the parabolics of events, but right now the bulls are calling the shots. Yeah, the bulls are calling the shots. Well, uh, talking about uh, regulation, it's been about a year now since uh, the central bank you know, stopped uh, crypto transactions uh, with uh, deposit money banks. And the report shows that Nigeria's peer-to-peer -peer transactions has risen by 16% uh, uh, year on year. Quite interesting. Yeah, it's very surprising, knowing fully well that um, the Apex Bank um, on February 5th, um, 2021, were forced um, sanctions against crypto transactions uh, via their uh, financial ecosystem. Well, despite that, we, just like you rightly said, we, we saw that um, on two major platforms, uh, Paxful and Local Bitcoin, Nigerians pulled about $400 million. That's very big, uh, more than um, Kenya, South Africa, and Ghana combined. So that just tells you that Nigeria is still the biggest crypto market in terms of um, transactions. But um, uh, the other narrative is that you need to look at the fact that Nigerians are paying as a premium because uh, they can't, um, a lot of Nigerians use cash and uh, have a cash based um, uh, system. So uh, the challenge is that now Nigerians are forced to go to P2P where prices are often. Uh, at the mercy of arbitrage and um, greedy middlemen. So uh, right now, it um, goes as high as 30% more. So Nigerians are paying like 30% more to purchase Bitcoin. But that has not really dampened Nigeria's momentum because if you look at the US and the Nigerian SEC recently announced that the average Nigerian in the capital market is 50 years old. So that tells you where the majority of Nigerians, young Nigerians, are going to the crypto market. But do you think, you know, the, the target of the central bank, you know, for... Uh, telling the banks not to carry out crypto transactions. Do you think they've uh, hit the target at all? Yeah, I think, I think to be fair, I think they've, they've achieved um, to certain, if you look at metrics uh, level, because if you understand the rationality behind that was that they felt that um, crypto transactions were posing systemic risk and um, they, they saw remittance dropping to record low in 2020, especially when taking the case of year-to-year -year business. So I think they've achieved some stance on control, curtailing and that momentum because you can't, um, you cannot underestimate the power of the CPN. But um, if you look at the bigger context, uh, the decentralized nature of the crypto market has made it very difficult for total enforcement to take in play. So I, I think um, it's, a, it's a big win for the CPN enforcing and bringing out the inner to try and change the momentum. But um, 
it's, it's led to the same. If that momentum will continue, because uh, just like it's rightly said, people are still going into the Bitcoin market, especially right. in Nigeria. Right, people are still going hard there. Okay, uh, it's a new week. Now, what are you expecting for Bitcoin this week? Yeah, uh, well, you know, the, uh, book, Bitcoin put a lot of bookmakers, including me, wrong because I had bearish outlook uh, since the beginning exactly. of the year. But uh, <laughs> I'll be watching at U.S. inflation and data report coming out on Thursday. If I see any uh, any tick up uh, towards um, inflation region, definitely will be very bearish for Bitcoin because right now we know we all know that um, interest rates are going to rise. But if there's going to be an high inflation number, then I think the bulls will have to stay exhausted because that narrative will pull very damp into their momentum. All right, all right, Lumile, we'll keep tracking it. Thank you so much, Lumile. Thank you. All right, looking at the uh, top five gainers that we see, uh, Shiba. Shiba Inu is there, topping that count is up about 24% uh, this morning. A lot going on with Shib. I will see they've uh, started the uh, layer two protocol for uh, called Shibarium. And they also have the Sheep swap and a lot of other developments coming up. So I see uh, traders taking position in Sheep. It's up 24% uh, this morning. Loop Ring, it's up 14%. Axe Infinity. Another big uh, move with that. It's at seventy dollars twenty-four cents. They had their uh, Twitter space, and uh, so, uh, supposedly somebody felt they saw uh, Elon Musk uh, actually attending that uh, spaces on Twitter. So I guess that's why the price is spiking right now. Uh, Cilio, five dollars thirty-one, up thirteen point one one percent. And you see the losers count is quite lean this morning, showing that uh, traders are moving away from stable coins and getting the, uh, back into the old coins, trying to make some gains uh, right now. So in its, uh, it's looking quite good. And the market is really green. Really green. And we'll see how long the greenness <laughs> or the uh, bullish sentiment. How long sentiment, that, yeah, continues. How the bullish sentiment will last for the week. Uh, we, we're, we're here following the yeah, market. Yeah, watching so. it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laddie. Thank you. Well, that's it on the program for today. The first one for the week. Four more to go. <laughs> Let's do it again tomorrow. But don't forget, at 1.30, there'll be Business Incorporated. We'll give you updates from the world of business. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Tune in to Just Nigeria and get the lowdown on the issues that really matter. You have the world at your fingertips. Check out the Nigerian shape in the future at home and around the world. What inspired the film was my life story. And hear from those voices without a platform. That I lost my brother. This is your country. Anything you set your mind to, you can bring to life. This is Just Nigeria. A partnership between the BBC and Channels TV every Wednesday at 9 p.m. My name is Kedija Nimud, I'm in SS2. Before I started using the Udashin app, learning hasn't been the best. I had so many challenges with Felix. Math was basically my rival. I didn't, I hardly knew what Pythagoras theory was. I hardly knew uh, algebra. After I started using the Udashin app, it has been a game changer since then. Understanding physics was a lot more easier because the tutors break down each topic into details. I like the video lessons. I like the teachers, how they break it down. I would definitely recommend it to my friends because it has been helpful since then. Download on the Google Play Store and Apple App Store. Also available on web at ulesson.com.
Well, hello and welcome to News Track on Channels Television. I'm Kayode Okikulu. Our top stories now. We begin with education as the Academic Staff Union of Universities has begun nationwide mobilization of its members to update them on the discussions between the union and the federal government before taking decision on the next line of action. Well, although the national body of ASU has kept mum over inquiries regarding its directives to have a lecture-free day in government universities across the country, a member of the union confirmed to Channels Television that ASU chairmen in all its branches have been directed to hold congresses and suspend lecture on the day which they choose for the congress. The Academic Staff Union of Universities and the federal government have been at each other's throat over welfare issues of members and the state of universities across the country. A recent ultimatum by the lecturers expired in December 2021 after the union suspended its longest industrial action in Nigeria's academic history in December 2020.